Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Adolescent Thrombosis, Etiology, Prophylaxis, and the Role of Hormonal Therapy. My name is Carrie Funkhauser, and I'm the Director of Education for the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. I will be moderating today's webinar. The Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders mission is to ensure that all women and girls with blood disorders are correctly diagnosed and optimally managed at every life stage. To this end, we aim to provide education to healthcare providers on the medical consequences and unique issues for women and girls with blood disorders. Today's presenters are Dr. Lakshmi Sirvas, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, Hematology, Oncology, and Co-Director of the Young Women's Bleeding Disorder Clinic at Texas Children's Hospital and Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. She's joined by Dr. Jennifer Dietrich, Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as Pediatrics, Fellowship Director in Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology, Chief of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology at Texas Children's Hospital, and the CME Director of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Baylor College of Medicine. She is also a co-director of the Young Women's Bleeding Disorder Clinic at Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. The Activity Medical Director for today's webinar is Dr. Andrew James from Duke University Medical Center. The planning committee for today's presentation includes James Munn and Drs. Barbara Alving, Barbara Conkel, Roshni Kulkarni, Kenneth Mann, Evelyn Lockhart, and Jennifer Dietrich. In accordance with the Crichton University Health Sciences Continuing Education Policy, the faculty and planning committee for today's webinar have disclosed any significant financial interest or other relationships of interest relative to the topics that will be discussed during this program. Such disclosures allow you to better evaluate the objectivity of the information presented in the lecture. You may learn more about this at the Foundation's website, fwgbd.org. To ensure the best sound quality during the webinar today, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. However, all attendees will have the opportunity to participate in a question and answer session with the instructors at the end of the webinar. You can submit your questions during or after the webinar via the chat box in your GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We gladly welcome your input. This learning activity is offered through the Crichton University Health Sciences Continuing Education Program, which has been accredited for offering 1.0 AMA PRA Category 1 credit for physicians and 1.0 contact hour for nursing professionals. The following are the learning objectives for today's webinar. For those who wish to refer to these later, we will record and archive this webinar on our website, again, fwgbd.org. I would now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Lakshmi Servas. Thank you, Carrie, and the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders for organizing this webinar. For the first half of this webinar, I will be talking about the prevalence of adolescent thrombosis focusing on female adolescents, the various predisposing risk factors and comorbidities, and the thrombosis and gynecologic bleeding complications that are unique to adolescent females, and talk briefly about the preventive strategies in adolescent thromboembolism. I will now begin with an overview on the prevalence of adolescent thrombosis. The first this slide shows several studies that have been published in the, um, with studies coming from the United States on the epidemiology of adolescent venous thromboembolism. The first study is the data from National Hospital Discharge Survey from 1979 to 2001, which showed a bimodal age peak for thromboembolism in children, both in infants and adolescents. The incidence rate of venous thromboembolism 
adolescence was high at 11.4 venous thromboembolism per 100,000 children per year with a very significant p-value. Females, female adolescents were at increased risk with an incidence rate higher at 14.9 when compared to their male counterparts with an incidence rate of 8.1. And the study also showed that teenage girls 27% of the teenage girls had associated pregnancy with a dramatically increased incidence rate of 108.6 DVT per 100,000 teenage girls per year with pregnancy. The pediatric health information system data from 2001 to 2007 showed that patients between 13 to 18 years of age formed about 30% of all the thromboembolism admissions and the rate and the recurrence rate for venous thromboembolism was much higher in adolescents. Females were almost equally affected in the study. The kids inpatient database from 2006 also reported that the greatest proportion of patients at risk were those older than 15 years, forming about 37.8% of the patient population. And at highest risk were the 10 to 14 years age group with a relative risk of 1.62 and the 15 to 18 years age group with a relative risk of 1.89. Also, the nationwide inpatient sample data reported on 78,000 patients and showed a highest odds ratio, an adjusted odds ratio of 6.25 in adolescents. Here again, females were equally affected when compared to males. Outside the United States, there have been um, studies published in, from uh, data registries in other countries. Nationwide population-based data study in Denmark in children 0 to 18 years of age with first ever venous thromboembolism or arterial thromboembolism over a period of 1994 to 2006 also showed a bimodal peak in infants and adolescents and showed that the highest incidence rates for thromboembolism was in the patients with ages between 15 to 18 years, incidence rate of 8.46. In this study as well, females were predominantly affected with a higher incidence rate of 13.37 when compared to males with an incidence rate of 4.53. The Canadian uh, venous thromboembolism registry was published in 1994, which again showed the bimodal age peak and a very high incidence for thromboembolism in adolescents 11 to 18 years with, rate, uh, with a population of about 50% being adolescents in their study. In this study, females were equally affected. So from all these studies, I think we can um, infer that there is a bimodal peak distribution of thromboembolism in children, in neonates, and in adolescents. So adolescents are at increased risk for venous thromboembolism. And females in most of these studies have incidence rates either equivalent to or higher when compared to the male population. The study of SETI and colleagues also looked at the variety of risk factors and comorbidities that predispose to thromboembolism in the pediatric population and uh, demonstrated that both acute as well as chronic comorbidities can lead to thromboembolism. But in adolescents, interestingly, the ratio of these acute and chronic illnesses were equivalent um, when uh, you look at the predisposition for thromboembolism. So overall, we can categorize the risk factors and comorbidities for thromboembolism in the adolescent population broadly as inherited or congenital that will include inherited thrombophilia as well as anatomic causes acquired comorbidities such as cancer, trauma, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Sickle cell disease, though a congenital disorder, has a variety of uh, acquired uh, risk factors such as uh, the inflammatory status during a vaso-occlusive crisis, surgical um, time period when there is an increase in the inflammatory um, status as well, and infection and other modifiable risk factors such as obesity, hormonal therapy, and sedentary habits. In the next few slides, we will take a quick look at many of these risk factors that uh, lead to uh, adolescent venous thromboembolism. First of all, anatomic abnormalities. Um, an important entity is paget schroeder syndrome that affects the upper extremity. This is predominantly reported in the adolescent and the young adult age group. About one-third of these patients are females. 
the dominant limb is affected here in patients who are involved in some competitive sport or music activity that leads to strenuous movements of the upper limbs. The presentation can be venous claudication, acute or chronic deep vein thrombosis. About 10% of these patients have been reported to develop pulmonary embolism. As shown in this picture, because of repetitive movement of the upper extremity, there is pectoral muscle hypertrophy that then causes extrinsic compression of the subclavian vein and causes intimal damage. These patients typically have other coexisting risk factors such as hormonal therapy, dehydration, or inherited thrombophilia. Here is a photograph of a patient with Paget Schroeder syndrome, and because of the deep vein occlusion, there is engorgement of the superficial venous system in that area of distribution. The anatomic abnormality in the lower extremity is May Turner syndrome, which again affects patients in their second and third decade, and predominantly involves females. There are several coexisting risk factors such as hormonal therapy, pregnancy, postpartum status, prolonged immobilization, dehydration, and underlying thrombophilia. As shown in this uh, image, this entity is because of external compression of the left common iliac vein by the right common iliac artery that crosses over. Patients can be asymptomatic or can develop acute or chronic deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, and in extreme cases, left common iliac vein rupture also has been reported. Another very rare entity is agenesis of inferior vena cava that affects uh, about 5% uh, of patients with venous thromboembolism in the less than 30 years of age, and uh, one-third of these patients present with bilateral lower extremity thrombosis. So it is important to uh, know about the presence of these underlying anatomic abnormalities to be able to manage these patients appropriately. Moving on to inherited thrombophilia, whereas there are recommendations to test pediatric patients for inherited thrombophilia when they develop unprovoked thromboembolism, there are no clear-cut recommendations for testing adolescents for inherited thrombophilia when they develop thromboembolism. So an interesting study um, which looked at the Maestro registry data, which is a single center cross-sectional study registry from two, um, reported on their experience from 2000 to 2010, when they looked at thrombophilia prevalence according to age at the first occurrence of thromboembolism. Of total of 40, 90 patients, they included both adolescents and all the way up to adulthood. The age range from 8 to 87 years with a median age of 43 majority of these patients were females. And as you can see in this bar chart on the right side, any thrombophilia or individual single thrombophilia factors or a combination of thrombophilic risk factors were present much more frequently in the younger age group when compared to the older age group. So the probability of detecting thrombophilia in patients less than or equal to 20 years was very high at 49% when compared to those older than 70 years at 21.9% with a significant fee value. Moving on to pediatric antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, we all know that it is an autoimmune um, disorder with increased risk for thromboembolism. The International Registry on Pediatric Antiphospholipid Antibody Syndrome reported on their experience on 121 patients derived from 24 pediatric centers across 14 countries. And uh, patients um, were predominantly females. As we know, autoimmune disorders um, are present predominantly in females. Median age was 10.7 years. This included both primary antiphospholipid antibody syndrome as well as secondary APS because of autoimmune disease as well as malignancy. And as shown in this table, these patients had developed both venous thrombosis at a variety of sites, causing significant morbidity, as well as arterial thrombosis, including ischemic stroke. Also, in this study, they noted that even though antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is a high-risk state for developing thromboembolism, these patients typically had several other coexisting risk factors, including inherited thrombophilia. It is a very um, serious uh, comorbidity wherein there is a high risk of recurrent thrombosis as well at 19% and mortality was reported at around 5.7%. Moving on to the association of thromboembolism in patients with cancer, 
Sarah O'Brien and colleagues um, looked at the pediatric health information database and reported on the, this association from 2001 to 2008. They looked at a total of uh, 9,721 adolescents with a diagnosis of cancer. 42% of these were females, and they reported an incidence of about 5% of thromboembolism in these patients. And interestingly, patients with leukemia, lymphoma, and bone and soft tissue sarcoma had a higher risk for developing thromboembolism. Another single institutional study, which is a retrospective cohort study of 726 children with cancer, also reported similar findings with an increased odds ratio at 1.84 in uh, patients older than or equal to 10 years, and also increased odds ratio in patients with leukemia, lymphoma, and sarcoma. Concluding that perhaps the increased venous thromboembolism risk in these adolescents with cancer is likely due to the changes in the adolescent's hemostatic system with the reduction in fibrinolytic factors and response. Sickle cell disease is a very important uh, disorder, another comorbidity that can predispose to thromboembolism. A large study rep reported from the data from cooperative study of sickle cell disease showed that there is increased risk for deep vein thrombosis as well as pulmonary embolism. These patients were older than or equal to 15 years of age, so the study included adolescents in addition to adults. And as you can see in these charts, there was increased risk for deep vein thrombosis, but definitely there was a significant increased risk for pulmonary embolism starting from the adolescent age group. And as shown in this table, even though the risk for uh, the incidence rate for deep vein thrombosis was increased at 1.9, this incidence rate was almost double that uh, for pulmonary embolism at 3.6. There have been several other case reports and case series reporting on um, pulmonary embolism in adolescent sickle cell patients. Also, uh, the study uh, from cooperative study of sickle cell disease showed that patients with pulmonary embolism also carried an increased mortality rate, and often these patients were underdiagnosed uh, for, for the uh, presence of pulmonary embolism. Moving on to the risk of thromboembolism in patients with trauma, whereas it is a common practice to institute thromboprophylaxis in adults with trauma, this is not the case in children and definitely not the case in adults as well in many institutions. So the study um, reporting on the data from National Trauma Data Bank discussed as to when do children become adults and when should we start thromboprophylaxis, and they reported on their experience on uh, patients um, of about 402,000, quarter of these were females. Patients were less than or equal to 21 years of age. And as you can see in this bar chart, the incidence of thromboembolism was lower during the pediatric age group, but as you enter into the adolescent age group, you see that the risk dramatically increased. So the incidence rate of uh, thromboembolism increased significantly as shown here in this table, when compared to younger children, the adjusted odds ratio for the likelihood of developing venous thromboembolism during hospital admission of after traumatic injury doubled for the 13 to 15 years age group and almost quadrupled for the more than or equal to 16 years age group. Obesity and thrombosis is an association that has been discussed uh, a lot in the literature. A pediatric study by Pearson and colleagues reported on the association of thrombosis, specifically looking at uh, ischemic stroke as well as cerebral um, cranial sinus venous thrombosis in hospitalized pediatric patients when compared to the controls. And you can see in this chart that in patients with BMI more than 75, there was an increased number of children with uh, cranial sinus venous thrombosis when compared to their controls. The median age of this patient population was around 10. Also, another large population-based case control study in Netherlands looking at patients with first episode of venous thromboembolism showed that there was a two-fold increased risk of thromboembolism with obesity and also a 10-fold increased risk in females in the reproductive age group 
15 to 45 years including adolescence on oral contraceptives when their BMI was more than 25 kilos per meter squared. So there are several reports of adolescents on hormonal therapy containing estrogen reporting on the occurrence of deep vein thrombosis as well as pulmonary embolism. Another interesting association is the occurrence of cerebral venous thrombosis in adolescent females on oral contraceptives. So the study um, by Ostemir and colleagues reported in 2015 um, reported on 22 female adolescents on estrogen containing hormonal therapy who developed cerebral venous thrombosis. Uh, interestingly, these patients had many other additional coexisting risk factors such as inherited thrombophilia, obesity, autoimmune disorders, and smoking. So in patients on hormonal therapy, when they complain about headache or when they have any other neurologic findings, it is very important to think about this entity and to do the appropriate imaging modality such as uh, MR venogram to look for the presence of cerebral venous thrombosis. Looking at gamer's thrombosis, this is perhaps an emerging entity. There are several case reports, such as the one shown here that talks about pulmonary venous thromboembolism due to extreme media gaming in an adolescent. And the CT scan image is shown here, um, showing a large thrombus in the left pulmonary artery, which is partly calcified, and a smaller thrombus in the right pulmonary artery. There are such reports also uh, with prolonged use of computer games as a risk factor for deep vein thrombosis. So there are several case reports that talk about extreme cases of thromboembolism in otherwise healthy adolescents, such as bilateral venous thromboembolism, recurrent venous thromboembolism, and pulmonary embolism. There are only few educational websites that address the physical issues related to continuous gaming and sedentary status. So it is important for physicians and patients to be aware of this entity also as a potential predisposing risk factor for thromboembolism in adolescents. In addition to the risk factors and the comorbidities that we talked about, there are several other risk factors that are present in other children as well as in adults. Central venous line is a common risk factor that is also reported in adolescents as a risk factor. Infections, surgery, which is a, a period of inflammation, other inflammatory states such as inflammatory bubble disease, immobility, and also smoking can all cause thromboembolism in the adolescent population. So we were curious to look at our own experience at our institution in regards to adolescent thromboembolism. And we did a retrospective review of our experience from over a 10 year time period. Of a total of 64 patients, half of them were females with a median age of 16 years. These patients had both um, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, as well as arterial thrombosis. And as you can see in this bar chart, um, the predisposing were many. The most important being obesity, also central venous catheters, infections, surgery, immobility, autoimmune disorders, estrogen was an important risk factor in the female adolescents, anatomic risk factor, and inherited thrombophilia. Also unique to the management of female adolescents with venous thromboembolism is their risk for bleeding when they are placed on anticoagulation therapy. Heavy menstrual bleeding as well as hemorrhagic ovarian cysts is described in the literature as bleeding complications in these female patients. Adult studies report 35 to 66 percent increase in the incidence of heavy menstrual bleeding in females on warfarin. And a recent systematic review um, stated that both major bleeding as well as clinically relevant non-major bleeding is more frequent in females on the new or the novel oral anticoagulants when compared to males. There are very few studies that address this in adolescents, one study suggesting an incidence of about 22%. For hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, there are case reports and case series, and up to 50% of hemorrhagic ovarian cysts reported in females on patients are, um, are because of the anticoagulant use. So we looked at our experience, which was presented um, in the recently concluded Thrombosis and Hemostasis Society of North America meeting in Chicago in April of 2016. 
and we reported on 68 postmenarchal adolescents on anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents. Majority were uh, taking the medication uh, for thromboembolism therapy or prophylaxis. And as you can see here, um, about 19% of these patients had developed heavy menstrual bleeding. When we looked specifically at patients who were screened for heavy menstrual bleeding, this was higher at 25%. And 7% developed hemorrhagic ovarian cysts. Many of the patients with hem heavy menstrual bleeding needed therapy, and all patients with hemorrhagic ovarian cysts needed either surgical or medical therapy. And a, a large number of these patients required red cell transfusion because of significant blood, intra-abdominal blood loss. Another interesting finding of our study was that many of these patients uh, with uh, heavy menstrual bleeding, all of them were not uniformly screened for the presence of heavy menstrual bleeding when they were on anticoagulants. Only two-thirds of our patient population received um, some sort of a screening from the treating hematologist. Screening increased when the patients were on anticoagulation or on warfarin, and in certain ethnicities for reasons not clearly explained. Also, gynecology referral, either for counseling these patients about the risk of gynecologic bleeding complications or for management, um, happened only in about a third of this patient population. So we concluded that improved use of screening tools and provider awareness to identify gynecologic bleeding complications are needed in adolescents on anticoagulation. And um, I cannot reinforce any more uh, to state that active collaboration with gynecologists is required for appropriate management of the bleeding complications, as well as for appropriate uh, choice of hormonal therapy when needed for these patients. There are several um, primary and pro secondary prophylactic in indications as um, outlined by the CHEST guidelines published in 2012 for children uh, for thromboembolism, but there are no clear-cut recommendations for at-risk adolescents for thromboprophylaxis. A large multinational study of thromboprophylaxis in critically ill children looked at um, intensive care units in several countries um, across the globe and reported that the use of thromboprophylaxis in critically ill children was quite low. For mechanical thromboprophylaxis, it was only about 24% of these children received uh, mechanical thromboprophylaxis, and only about 12% received pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis. And this practice was highly variable across the intensive care units. So Rafidi and colleagues undertook an institutional initiative to uh, practice routine thromboprophylaxis in at-risk adolescents. The patients were risk stratified based on the variety of risk factors as listed here in this table. And they were classified as low-risk at-risk and high-risk patients. And the interventions were early ambulation for low-risk patients, early ambulation and mechanical prophylaxis for at-risk patients, and pharmacoprophylaxis was added for patients at high risk. A subsequent uh, publication uh, reported on the outcome of this institutional initiative and showed that there were no non-catheter-related venous thromboembolism in, uh, during the study period with a low incidence of bleeding. And also, you can see that many adolescents benefited from receiving this prophylaxis. Um, and the rate of venous thromboembolism prophylaxis increased from a baseline of 22% to average of 82% and sometimes up to even 100%. So to conclude my part of the presentation, uh, we have now seen that in the pediatric population, adolescents have an increased risk for developing thromboembolism and specifically adolescent females have increased risk for thromboembolism. And this risk is heightened in adolescent females in certain conditions, such as certain types of anatomic risk factors, autoimmunity, hormonal therapy containing estrogen. And we also saw that the risk factors are multifactorial in adolescents. Inherited thrombophilias are unmodifiable, but anatomic abnormalities when promptly diagnosed can be surgically corrected. The modifiable risk factors such as obesity, extreme gaming, and hormonal therapy can be modified to minimize the risk for thromboembolism. And several comorbidities also predispose to, sickle, um, to thromboembolism. And uh, recognizing that these are all risk factors 
can help to institute strategies for prevention as well as for appropriate management of these patients. And collaborative care by hematologists and gynecologists is very important when ma managing adolescent females with thromboembolism. And collaborative care along with other specialists is crucial to minimize the thromboembolism risk um, and uh, for management in other comorbidities as well. Mechanical and or pharmacologic prophylaxis can lessen the risk and or prevent recurrence, but future studies are required to study when and where to institute thromboprophylaxis for the at-risk adolescent population. With this, I'll conclude my part of the webinar presentation. I will now hand over to my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jennifer Dietrich, to discuss the role of hormonal therapy in adolescent thrombosis. Okay, thank you, Lakshmi. Uh, so thank you once again to the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders um, uh, to, uh, for inviting Lakshmi and I to speak to you today. Um, it's a pleasure to bring to you guys kind of two viewpoints, both the hematologic view and the gynecologic view for this population that is truly at risk. And so we're going to take a little bit of a different perspective and kind of switch over to, um, you know, that that um, we might kind of uh, look at from a gynecologic uh, perspective and how we sort of begin to interact with our, our hematology colleagues as we manage these patients. And so from our perspective as, as gynecologists, there, we're, there are really several different times in life when you know we may be faced with a patient who might be at risk. And so we have to think about the time of life. Is it peripuberty? Is it puberty? And then certainly the situation. Is there a medical or a surgical need for a specific patient with a um, thrombophilia or a risk um, or history of thrombosis? I'm going to go ahead and say next slide. So let's talk about risk groups in general. As gynecologists, this information impacts our decision to choose certain hormones, as even patients with thrombotic conditions will have gynecologic concerns for which hormonal, hormonal management is useful and, and may be absolutely necessary. So if an adolescent is sexually active, if an adolescent is having struggles with puberty and perhaps needs hormones for pubertal delay, in the situation of recurrent ovarian cysts, um, which may take the form of even hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, menorrhagia or heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, dysmenorrhea or heavy um, painful cramps, and then even premenstrual syndrome. Next slide. So let's talk about hormones and thrombosis in general. So if we think that the baseline thrombosis risk just in the general population for women is about 4 in 100,000, we know that there is a slight increase for um, a thrombosis risk on oral contraceptive pills. And so, you know, certainly that's magnified by two and a half times at 10 to 30 uh, per 100,000 individuals. But if we compare that to the risk in pregnancy, which is doubled beyond that um, to 60 in 100,000, it is something that we need to think about in terms of balancing um, the risk of hormonal exposure versus the risk of an unplanned pregnancy in a teen who is going to be at risk for a thrombotic event. Next slide. Can we go back? So let's talk about why these are so different. Next slide. So there are estrogen effects that we're all aware of in that there may be some upregulation of platelet binding factor production and increase in factor level production. And these risks are magnified even further in pregnancy. For example, there's just more estrogen and more hormones being secreted by the placenta. There's a um, plasma volume expansion and an increase in erythrocyte mass that occurs during pregnancy, along with an increase in fibrinogen and increase in factors uh, 5 through 10. Stasis is also more common. Um, this becomes more of an issue 
as women approach the term portion of their pregnancy. And so as they get closer to their due date, again, it may be harder for them to get around, harder for them to um, move around with ease. And, you know, for some women, it may be a time when they've been asked to be on bed rest. And so if stasis is more common, we have to think about this as a risky period um, uh, for women and for adolescents. And we sort of go back to Virchow's triad where we're balancing, you know, the body's ability to clot and the body's ability to dissolve clot to avoid um, both bleeding and clotting complications. Next slide. So let's talk about risk in a different way. If we think about a prothrombotic condition, on one column we, I have listed sort of various um, prothrombotic conditions, some of which involve hormonal states or use of hormones, and some of which we're using to compare to hematologic states. And so in pregnancy, I've kind of um, just, you know, discussed some of the risks, and this is looking at kind of a, um, a the risk for venous thrombolysis by itself uh, from a baseline state. So if the relative risk is, has been quoted as 4 to 12 in the postpartum state, interestingly, this is almost even doubled. If we compare this to um, utilizing a low-dose um, combined oral contraceptive pill, and when I say low-dose, I mean something you know around the 30 to 35 microgram range. In the high dose situation, this is nearly doubled, um, kind of uh, not quite to the level of, of pregnancy in the postpartum state, but still it's increased beyond that of a low dose pill. And in the high dose situation, I'm talking about a 50 microgram ethyl estradiol pill. This is not very different from the adolescent who may be, um, has a diagnosis of factor V lighten in the heterozygous state. But in the homozygous state, this is magnified. And someone who has factor V light, and even in the heterozygous state with combined oral contraceptive use, has an increase of thromboembolism. And so that's something we have to take into account as we're choosing therapies. Uh, we see a number of different um, thrombophilic conditions as well. And, you know, I just want to sort of point out that, um, you know, two of the most challenging uh, thrombophilic conditions include antithrombin 3 deficiency and protein S deficiency. These are um, heightened because simply by the nature of these types of deficiencies, they already confer a significant risk to our adolescent. And so certainly an, any individual who um, may have a thrombophilic risk or an inherited thrombophilia um, we want to discuss therapies that, that do not con uh, contain estrogen. And when these women consider becoming pregnant one day, again, a planned pregnancy is going to be the best situation. They are going to be, need to be managed by a high-risk um, obstetrician who can help them um, with managing anticoagulation therapies such that the pregnant state does not result in a thrombotic episode uh, during that time. Next slide. So uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has, um, you know, taken this very seriously as well. And as a result, you know, they have um, set forth some guidelines with regard to inherited thrombophilias in pregnancy. Um, they ultimately know that some adolescents may be diagnosed early and might be, um, you know, planning their families later on. But nonetheless, because it is a common situation and um, we know the various complications that can arise from inherited thrombophilias related to pregnancy, uh, not only for the mother but also for the baby, um, there are um, some really good uh, management guidelines set forth for obstetricians and gynecologists um, in this uh, practice bulletin number 138. Next slide. In addition, they've taken it one step further because antiphospholipid syndrome is another situation in which um, both thromboses and bleeding complications can result. And because this is sort of a spectrum in terms of its presentation and the time of diagnosis for, for some women, sometimes it may be during 
um, the prepubertal years. It could be during the time of adolescence, and it may be um, during the time that women are attempting to start their families, um, and perhaps diagnosed after a series of um, miscarriages uh, prior to delivery. And so, you know, again, um, this is a really great practice bulletin helping to guide um, the provider on, you know, how to screen some of the clinical features to anticipate and, you know, uh, what they consider as, as um, the clinical and laboratory and uh, criteria that are met in order to make this diagnosis. And then certainly how to manage it from that point forward. Next slide. So I thought we would go through a case just really quickly. So you have a 15-year-old female who presents the office for a regular cycle. She would like something to regulate her cycles. Aside from her cycles, she is healthy. Although she's recently become sexually active, even though her pregnancy test is negative today. Of note, she reports that her mother had a deep venous thrombosis in the past when she was in her 30s. Next slide. So given this clinical scenario, how do we decide what to use? There are some, you know, risky situations that your adolescent just brought up to you in your clinic. And so, um, you know, the, the World Health Organization, or the WHO, and the Centers for Disease Control, or the CDC, developed medical eligibility criteria to help providers. And these criteria are vetted extensively by experts and through reviews of meta-analyses, and they're updated every few years, especially when new data may be available to help guide providers. They try to balance all situations, knowing that many other practitioners in varying socioeconomic situations use these as decision-making tools. So whether these are being utilized by um, providers in the clinic setting or perhaps in a team clinic setting, where um, there, there may be um, you know, nurse practitioners or physician assistants who are trying to adhere to um, certain triage guidelines and um, decision-making tools and helping them assure that they are making um, good hormonal management decisions for adolescents who might be seeking, for instance, contraception. Next slide. So here's an example of how the tool um, is, is put together and what it looks like. And you can actually access this on the CDC website. And so there are several different categories um, where, you know, essentially they are graded one through four. And a category one would essentially list that there is no restriction. The method could absolutely, absolutely be used in um, this particular population. And if you look at the various conditions, they have several different um, conditions related to, you know, things like breastfeeding and all the way to deep venous thromboembolism, which is our topic of interest today. And then there are a variety of different hormones that are listed at the top, and you can kind of see that if we go down to the deep venous thromboembolism category, under the combined uh, uh, hormone category, whether it's a pill, patch, or a ring, that is automatically listed as number four for the majority of those cases, um, but you know doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's listed as number four. For example, a family history of deep uh, venous thromboembolism. So remember, we have to kind of balance the the risks and benefits. And although this may be a patient that we screen ahead of time, um, the family history in um, a first-degree relative, depending on the reason that they had a DVT, because remember it could be caused by something like trauma rather than something inherited, doesn't necessarily preclude you from giving a therapy if they need a therapy. Nonetheless, in many of these situations, um, in the deep venous uh, thromboembolism embolism category, progestin-only methods are listed as a Category 2, where generally the advantages outweigh the theoretical or proven risks. And so progestin-only therapy is a really good option for many of these patients. And, and again, you can see that most of these are listed as, as a 1 or a 2, where either there's no restriction or the advantages outweigh the risks. When we get into Category 3 and 4, where the risks outweigh the advantages 
or is completely unacceptable, we would avoid using that therapy specifically. Next slide. And so that's where it's listed at the top there. So I've just listed this again, so just quickly to reiterate, number one, a condition for which there is no restriction for the use of the contraceptive method. Number two, a condition for which the advantages using the method generally outweigh the theoretical or proven risks. Number three, a condition for which the theoretical or proven risks usually outweigh the advantages of using the method at all. And number four, a condition that represents an unacceptable health risk to the patient, and you should not use it. Next slide. All right, so this is looking at this um, in a, a little bit of a blown up view with regard to um, a deep venous thrombolysis, not on anticoagulant therapy or when someone is established on anticoagulant therapy for at least three months. Um, so, you know, again, there's uh, some variability, and um, but in general, we want to try to avoid combined methods. Nonetheless, we have progestin-only pills, which are abbreviated as POP at the top. We have progestin injections, we have progestin implants, and we have the levonorgestrel IUD, as well as the copper IUD. Now, one caveat with the copper IUD, as um, Dr. Srivas uh, specifically outlined, for patients who are on anticoagulant therapy, um, you know, one of the risk factors that we then uh, can struggle with is, is bleeding, heavy menstrual bleeding. And one of the things that can occur with the copper IUD is that some women do report heavier periods with the heavy while they're anticoagulant with the copper IUD. And so if that becomes an issue, um, there's always the opportunity to discuss the levonorgestrel IUD, which would eventually help control their periods and results in fewer periods over time. Next slide. So, easy, right? Well, you know, to some degree we have to work with our patients for that. Um, sometimes our patients may be very good about taking a method every day. Um, some patients may prefer to do something once a week, and others may just want an injection every three months. And so really, we kind of um, work with our patients. Next slide. And um, our American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has an additional practice bulletin, um, number 73, um, looking at the use of hormonal contraception in women with coexisting medical conditions, of which uh, thrombophilia and um, uh, history of thrombosis is included. Next slide. And so let's look at um, some of the thrombosis risks and hormones themselves. So I had mentioned the low dose and the high dose um, combined oral contraceptive pill in a prior slide. Ethinyl estradiol at 20 micrograms is an ultra low dose pill. And we can see that the relative risk um, for a thrombosis is nearly close to one or baseline. Um, so uh, the conferred risk is 1.1, whereas we start to increase a little bit in the 30 to 35 microgram ethinyl estradiol range. And then that's nearly doubled again in the 50 microgram range. If we look at all of the progestins, all of the progestins under two, and we have at least one that is less than the relative risk of one, but is essentially um, at a baseline risk. We have a few um, therapies that uh, have um, an increased risk beyond that of baseline quite a bit, and these include things like drospirinone, desogestrel, gestadin, and ciproterone acetate. Now again, these are um, minimally increased risks um, in the progesterone category compared to that in the ethinyl estradiol 30 to 35 microgram range. Next slide. And so um, when we're looking at treatment options for medical conditions, I think it's a really interesting way to look at it this way. When we're kind of looking at the problem as being contraception, this child needs contraception. We prescribe therapies include um, if there's a history of a thrombophilic condition, um, 
then that is going to change our method, method of therapy, and we are going to think about um, progestin-only methods. But if there's no history of thrombophilia, then all methods will be available to these patients. If there's a minor risk, as Dr. Srivast had discussed um, in several different categories, such as obesity or prolonged travel or smoking, still um, we are going to counsel our patients to, you know, again, be as active as they can, um, try to exercise and work on their obesity, and then we do want to make sure that um, in an adolescent category, even though their risk is not increased beyond that of a woman who is greater than 35 years of age, the combination of smoking and combined oral contraceptives is certainly not advocated, and we would be working with them to decrease their um, tobacco exposure. In addition, if there is a history of venous thrombo thromboembolism, we would be discussing all progesterone-only methods. Now, where this gets a little bit interesting is in the category of things like amenorrhea, okay, and endometriosis. So, in amenorrhea, in the absence of a cycle, means certainly we want to make sure that the child is not pregnant first. So, if you've ruled out pregnancy, okay, and there's no thrombophilic condition, obviously all methods and all hormonal replacement therapy would be available for use. This includes in the category of even minor risk. But in this situation where there's an inherited thrombophilia or major surgery, okay, we have to think about um, the type of estrogen delivery. We've previously talked about estrogens only in pill form, but in a transdermal estrogen um, form, we would be working with our hematologists to ensure that either they're continuing their hematologic therapies and their anticoagulation therapies, but the transdermal delivery of estrogen without having kind of a liver pass effect confers a lesser coagulation risk than that of a pill. And so that is a potential option um, under the watchful eye of a, of a hematologist and with gynecology and hematology in constant communication. In the endometriosis category, we have the um, progestin-only methods as an option in addition to GnRH agonists, which is essentially um, a means by which to uh, turn off all of the hypothalamic pituitary axis signals in order to downregulate the ovarian hormone production and result in an improvement for women who've had a confirmed uh, surgical diagnosis of endometriosis. And then finally, down in the premature ovarian insufficiency or failure category, again, this may be something that is uh, spontaneous or maybe post-ablative. Again, we would be working with hematology to deliver a transdermal form of estrogen as opposed to a pill form of estrogen, in addition to making sure that it would be safe for them to do um, in continuation with their anticoagulant therapy if it's still necessary. Next slide. So let's go to case two. We have a 13-year-old non-sexually active female who presents in the ER with severe abdominal pain that she reports began earlier today. She has a history of antiphospholipid syndrome and is currently on anoxaparin for a recent deep venous thromboembolic episode. She reports that she became menarchal one year ago and that her cycles have always been irregular. Her last cycle occurred about two weeks ago and a pelvic ultrasound that you have done in your office after presenting with the abdominal pain reveals a six centimeter um, hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. And as a result, uh, she's, she is in the ER. Next slide. So in this situation, um, you know, we might be thinking about, uh, you know, a, a short term or a long term use eventually. Um, a type of therapy to help prevent some of these episodes, but she's got this underlying thrombotic um, condition and thrombophilic condition, and so therefore, as a result of her therapies, she is having some heavy menstrual bleeding, a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, and the main thing as a gynecologist that I need to understand at that point is, is it an expanding hemorrhagic ovarian cyst? 
For many women, a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst is self-limiting, may only get a few centimeters in size, and again, we've already mentioned that this is six centimeters. If they are exhibiting signs of hemodynamic instability, then we need to think about proceeding into the operating room for surgery. We may need to coagulate um, the cyst bed at the base of the ovary in order to stop. And so some of the questions I'll be asking my hematologists in coordination with is the reversibility of therapy and how quickly we can go to the operating room and having some blood on hand um, if the cyst is truly expanding rapidly. Next slide. So as um, Dr. Srivast uh, mentioned in her previous slides, there really are few case reports related to hemorrhagic ovarian cysts and women on anticoagulation. And certainly when you add adolescents in the mix, there's very, very little information out there in the literature um, until our most recent study at our own institution. Next slide. In addition, we know that um, there is a increase in heavy menstrual bleeding among women who are on anticoagulation. And so in this specific study of a cohort of, of women 15 to 49, including um, some of the older adolescents that are already in that higher risk category for um, venous thromboembolic episodes, um, they looked at heavy menstrual bleeding days, both before anticoagulation and at, after anticoagulation therapy. And so what we see is that, you know, really, um, after anticoagulation therapy, the percent of women resulting or having reporting both menstrual periods in seven days and heavy bleeding uh, for that length of time increases um, compared to what their cycles were before anticoagulation therapy was initiated. Next slide. And so I've mentioned some of these uh, special um, considerations previously, but you know this is going to come up. There are many, many gynecologic concerns in pubertal females with blood disorders. And so this might even come up in, in a child who's presenting with precocious puberty and perhaps already has an underlying um, diagnosed thrombophilia. So um, if this is a situation and the child's already on an anticoagulant therapy of some sort, their actual presentation of puberty might also be precocious menarche. And then in order to balance that and um, help decrease the bleeding, obviously we have therapies to help control the puberty, but the, sometimes those take time to work. And so we'll have to be in communication with our hematologists about the reversibility of their anticoagulant therapy in order to help diminish the ongoing bleeding. So this is um, an example of a mini review that uh, we put together to help guide providers in the management of acute bleeding, regardless of um, the patient age and in certainly in various different situations. So many different management strategies available um, for you as the provider. Next slide. There are some options for management in the setting of increased acute bleeding, nonetheless, and we have to think about Burko's triad to some degree, as I mentioned before. We want to choose something that's helpful to manage the bleeding, but not something that's necessarily going to result in forcing the balance too far toward coagulability. Next slide. So in the acute setting, we do have progestins available to help manage the bleeding. And so, believe it or not, we can use uh, things like norethindrone acetate or medroxyprogesterone orally. Both of these therapies can be given every four hours and then um, sort of tapered uh, to an eventual uh, maintenance dose. And then for adolescents who are engaging in risk uh, behaviors, certainly transitioning them immediately or as soon as possible to a contraceptive therapy is ideal. Next slide. In the acute setting for these patients with thrombo thrombophilic um, conditions, we may have to use something like a balloon tamponade method as well. Again, adolescents, we want to try to be as, as, um, as minimally invasive as possible, but also avoid any kind of invasive um, 
therapies. They're not going to be uh, a population in which we engage in a dilation and curatage right away. We really want to try to uh, keep things less invasive. But one option we have, and we can certainly calculate the volume of the uterus in an adolescent on the basis of a, a, a balloon and on the basis of an ultrasound. And so, you know, um, if the ultrasound with three uh, dimensions of measurements gives you a volume um, that you can work with, you can place a Foley balloon on the inside of the uterine cavity, blow up the balloon to the size that, um, that the uterus can accompany, and it will help provide an internal tamponade while you're also working on your medical therapy. Next slide. And additional options for um, management in the setting of even acute and chronic bleeding can include things like an injectable depi, uh, depomedroxy progesterone acetate, which can be given in a subcutaneous fashion or an intramuscular fashion, an injectable uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, an edonegestral implant, and a levonegestral IUD. And so really, you know, the, the first um, can be utilized in the acute or chronic setting. But the, room, the last three are really that, um, that can be utilized for control of chronic bleeding because these therapies are going to take time to work. Next slide. So in summary, I hope you've understood that understanding thrombophilia is critical from a hematologic and gynecologic perspective. There are many hormonal options available and ultimately teaching patients about these options is critical at various stages of life. And so I am going to now turn it over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diedrich. And I'd like to thank both of our faculty for their excellent presentations today. For participants of this webinar interested in receiving continuing education credit, instructions for completing an evaluation and applying for credit will be mailed to you shortly after this webinar has been completed. At this time, we will proceed with the question and answer part of our program. And as a reminder, participants can submit their questions via the chat box in your GoToWebinar panel, and questions will be answered in the order they are received. So if you do have a question, please let us know. And if there are no questions at this time, Please uh, know that if you do have one following this webinar, we encourage you to visit our Ask the Experts feature on our website, FWDBG, and submit your question online. We do have one um, question that just came through, and I would uh, direct this, I believe, to Dr. Dietrich. And the question is, uh, do you have a concern regarding next planum breakthrough bleeding? Okay, I'm just going to take myself off of mute. Um, so, next one on, um, or the the unigestral implant, um, does have a pretty common side effect, which happens to be um, breakthrough bleeding in um, the initial months in which it's placed. We do have opportunities to control the breakthrough bleeding related to this, and so certainly. Um, if we use this as a, an option primarily for contraception among the female who may be at risk, we counsel them about the, the risk for breakthrough bleeding. And we counsel them that, you know, we want them to have an additional backup therapy on hand, such as progestin-only pills, um, or to call us right away if they are already on an anticoagulant therapy, because certainly they will be in the category of women who are anticoagulated where a breakthrough bleeding episode, maybe a heavy breakthrough bleeding episode. And so we just, we want to be prepared. They need to be counseled. But if it is the therapy that after thorough counseling and discussion that they've chosen, because it's going to be a better, more effective birth control method for them as well, um, then we're going to work with them uh, toward that after they're counseled. Great. Thank you. Um, this one is for uh, Dr. Uh, Shirvaz. Um, how long is the physiologic risk of thrombosis in postpartum state? 
or Dr. Dietrich, either one. Uh, so it's it, the the risk lasts for six weeks. So um, for many women who have just delivered, the um, riskiest time frame for them is the six weeks postpartum. And so this is a, a time in which um, we as the obstetrician gynecologists are going to have heightened suspicion for various conditions that present in the postpartum period, um, including a thromboembolic event. And um, Dr. Srivast, do you have anything to add? No, I agree. I think um, I agree with Dr. Dietrich. The risk for thrombosis certainly increased during the uh, postpartum status. Um, for, um, for the time period uh, then the, that the postpartum is defined uh, for about six weeks postpartum. Great. Dr. Uh, Shirvas, this question uh, is for you. What is the thrombosis risk of using stymate and hormonal therapy at the same time? Thank you. Um, so certainly uh, when you're using medications uh, which can increase risk for thrombosis and uh, when you're using more than one such uh, treatment option, the risk is enhanced and this is something that we counsel our patients about. Um, uh, uh, usually the patient can be given one type of therapy, whether it is hormonal or hemostatic therapy. Um, as a primary therapy and then a supplemental therapy, they can uh, use an additional option as well. Uh, but while using um, BDAVP, when the von Willebrand factor increases uh, significantly to more than 250 or the factor rate is elevated to more than 200, there is a risk for thrombosis. Uh, when you're using uh, the parenteral formulations of DDAVP, you can certainly uh, control for this and avoid uh, repeated use of um, DDAVP when the von Willebrand factor or the factor rate is high. But this may not be practically feasible when patient is using the nasal formulation. So the uh, patients have to be counseled that there may be an increase um, when there are combinations used, certainly with hormonal therapy and stymate. Likewise, also, uh, there is a possibility, at least a theoretical possibility, with the use of estrogen-containing hormonal therapy and antifibrinolytic agents. Great. Thank you. This will be our last question. Uh, what is the risk of thrombosis with Lupron? Either one. So, you know, really... Um, uh, the gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist um, initially kind of upregulates just uh, slightly the hypothalamic pituitary axis, but it's very similar to that of progestin therapy in that it's a safe option for women to use because certainly while that there's a burst of hormonal like, um, uh, response um, to the hormone itself, it immediately starts to downregulate. And so really it's meant to kind of turn things down and so it's going to have a relative risk closer to the one category. Um, I agree with Dr. Dietrich. I think if you look at the um, CDC and the WHO um, guidelines, uh, the risk category for the um, Lupron is uh, going to be um, similar to the um, other progesterone only modalities. Wonderful, thank you. Well, this concludes our question and answer period. For those of you who still have questions, please submit them to us at, on our Ask the Expert feature on our website. We also have archived the questions that we did not answer, and we will get those answers to you after this webinar. Once you leave today, you will receive a post-test and an evaluation, and we hope you will complete that for us. Also, this webinar will be archived and available for viewing on our website, and you will be able to access it under the archived webinar section. On behalf of the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders, thank you so much again for joining us today, and we look forward to your return for future Foundation webinars. Thank you.